welcome to the AHOA Educational Experience. I'm Chip Rogers and thank you for joining us today. My guest on today's show, we'll start with Sal Sameo, who is an attorney with Ford and Harrison. And to his right, we have Jacob Monty, who is the managing partner at Monty and Ramirez. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Give us a little background on your specialty of law, if you will, because that's going to kind of form the basis of our show today. Sal? So my name is Sal Sameo, and I'm the managing partner for New Jersey office of Ford and Harrison. Um, Ford and Harrison is a labor and employment boutique where we um, practice exclusively in the area of labor and employment law. My particular background, I came from the United States Department of Labor where I spent the majority of my career and practiced both ERISA but primarily wage and hour law. I've been a wage hour uh, practitioner for over 15 years and um, that is be the bulk of my practice is wage and hour law. So. so you've been on, now that you did work for the Department of Labor and now you're on the other side of it. <laughs> That's so, right. so you know their tricks inside and out is what I you're do, saying. I do, I <laughs> do. And I also happen to be seconded to, um, for two years to the largest corporation in America where I worked internally within that company to help right. bring them into compliance. So hey, I bring a unique perspective because I've seen how large companies operate and also right. how the government operates and also how you know, law firms operate. So. And Jake? I'm Jacob Monty. Uh, my friends call me Jake. I am a labor and immigration lawyer out of Houston. My firm is called Monty and Ramirez. We represent companies with large Hispanic workforces. A lot of those employers are in the hospitality industry, some are in the restaurant industry. And we focus on helping employers deal with issues like sexual harassment complaints, uh, wage and hour investigations, class actions uh, filed by employees, and union uh, organizing drives filed by unions to try to organize the employees. We also work on immigration compliance as well. And I, I want to focus, uh, at least in this first segment, on a little bit of the, I guess, the history and, and today's status of, of union organizing. I mean, I guess if you, if you go back in American history and you see you had this buildup of unions and a lot of that was in response to there, there was no OSHA for worker protection. Uh, you had a lot of one company towns and, and, and employees could be abused. Those things have gone away and perhaps some would argue the need for a lot of union organizing has gone away in the private sector. But I guess what we're seeing is the, the and correct me if I'm wrong, private sector numbers may be down, public sector unions are, are, have been increasing lately, but the activity even among private sector unions seems to be really becoming engaged here in the last couple of years. Why is that happening? Unions file organizing petitions like never before. Uh, part of this is uh, initiatives that were started uh, over a year ago when everyone was talking about the Employee Free Choice Act, which was a proposal by the Obama administration that would take away an employee's right to vote for an election. I mean, what they were trying to do is have an election uh, be done away with and have the whole issue of whether a union got into a company decided on if a majority of the people signed a card. So a lot of what we're seeing now is uh, follow follow up from the rush of, of cards that were signed uh, when EFCA was a big priority. Uh, organized labor is focusing on minority workforces. It, it, it's that simple. And uh, you know, we're seeing them focus on the lodging industry, the restaurant industry, the supermarket industry, the construction. Uh, and uh, they have a partner with the Obama administration right now that has given them some favorable rulings. And they're trying to capitalize on that. And, and is this a, you know, in, in the world of politics, I mean, that I guess some people would claim it's a political payback, but clearly the unions were very much in favor of Mr. Obama winning and he became the president. And um, I mean, do you sense this? You've been on in the government side yeah. and on the private sector side. I mean, are you sensing that this is his effort to make sure that he tells them, I got your back and I'm following through? Absolutely. I mean, one thing I've noticed with the Obama administration, well, with the union strategy with the Obama administration than in the past, in the past, the unions took a shotgun approach. They put a lot of money in different buckets, and it didn't really go anywhere. Um, with this um, administration, um, when Obama ran the first time, they took more of a rifle approach where they put all their money on certain issues, and EFCA was one of them. Um, and by focusing their funding and their, their lobbying into very, very specific issues, I think they've been very successful. And the other thing, and I'll I'll defer to Jake again on this, is the rise of social media and um, these new areas of law where people are, whether or not it's considered organizing or not organizing, and again, I mean, Jake is really the expert in labor law, so I'll defer to him. 
Um, and that, that's, a, that's an interesting thought you bring up because it's not just, um, we, we think of union organizing or people standing outside with picket signs. And, you know, I, I know there's one hotel that when I go to Chicago, they're always there outside that one hotel right. at all times. But now you think there are so many other ways to begin to deliver this message in social media. I mean, I, I hadn't thought of that until now. That is a way that some of this activity is taking place. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, criticizing your boss on Facebook uh, might be deemed insubordination by your company, but the National La Labor Relations Board has taken the approach that that's concerted activity and that you do have a protected right to speak out against uh, terms and conditions of employment uh, on the social media uh, wow. avenues. So that is a, a change that we didn't have uh, three years ago. And unions have also become a lot more savvy with, with my clients. What I've seen is they'll create, let's say your company is www.xyz.com. They'll create a shadow site called www.xyz.net. And on there, they'll put on all this union organizing stuff and try to really organize. So I think that new media, whether it's um, social networking, Facebook, LinkedIn, or other sites, plus you know the creation of websites and YouTube. I mean, if you just Google yourself as an employer on YouTube, you may be surprised to find out that there's an organizing drive that you weren't right. even aware of. So Absolutely. I think new media has become a big issue with you know unions and organizing drives. I want to talk a, a quickly about um, the EFCA or the Employee Free Choice Act um, in that typically these type of uh, efforts are they, they go through the legislative process and in this particular case it, it started to make its way through the legislative process it got stopped and then there was an election and the, the House of Representatives turned to the other party and it was clear that no longer was there the opportunity for that to happen statutorily but it seems as if the administration has used its powers from the executive branch to begin to attempt to implement EFCA even without the law specifically authorizing it. I mean, are you seeing this happen? Absolutely. Well, you know, the EFCA for right now is on the back burner because they just don't have the support in the Congress. But we are seeing significant changes uh, with, for example, the ambush election rule that was just passed last month that goes into effect at the end of April, which would shorten the period of time that a company has to prepare a campaign against uh, the union. Typically the way organizing happens is unions operate underground for a period of time and they work on getting the card signed by the employees. So many times the employer doesn't know that organizing is happening until the union raises its head and files uh, for a petition with the National Labor Relations Board or if uh, they're careless and somehow management, a savvy supervisor, notices some of the warning signs. But the quickie election rule or the ambush election rule would shorten the period of time a company has to respond to a petition from about 43 days to about 20 days. Doesn't sound like a lot of time, but that additional time gives the union a great deal of advantage in this area. So if you were, if there was organizing going on, and as you referenced a moment ago, some of it could actually be taking place uh, through social media networks. You have this, uh, essentially this organizing going on, all of a sudden now the employer learns about it and the time window in which they're able to respond or present the other side of the case, so to speak, uh, under the quickie elections will be shortened significantly, which of course is all designed for one purpose and that is a, a dif differing outcome or a, per a percentage, a winning percentage greater for those who have the time and they're organizing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Another significant change, Chip, is a new posting requirement that goes into effect this April that for the first time in history uh, mandates that employers give employees notice of their right to join a union. You know, we've had the NLRA for you know, 60 plus years and we never had that obligation, but now employers will face an unfair labor practice charge if they don't have that notice posted. If they have more than 20% of their employees that don't speak English, the notice has to be posted in the language that the employees speak, and it tells them their rights to join a union specifically. Wow. So that is another big change as well. well we've got a lot more to talk about. Uh, we need to take a quick time out, and we'll be back right after this.
Welcome back to the Yahoo Educational Experience. I'm Chip Rogers. My guest this week, as we're talking about union organizing and labor issues, are both Sal Sameo, an attorney with Ford and Harrison, and Monty or Jacob Monty with Monty and Ramirez. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. We talked a little bit about the history of unionization and how it has it, it has changed over the decades, and of course, has changed uh, significantly since the new administration took over. But how do let, let's say you're an employer and you you're your employee workforce is not unionized. Um, what should you be looking for to make sure that that doesn't happen to you? What, what, what are some of the signs to make sure? Well, there's an old saying, Chip. Uh, if you end up with a union, it's because you did something to deserve it. In a lot of ways, uh, that is true. What I found in my years of practicing law is it's always something emotional. It's not wages. It's not uh, a 401k plan, it's a yelling supervisor. I call it the old yeller. You know, someone who <laughs> yells at employees, someone who threatens employees with, it, with termination, uh, an employer who abuses his position and sexually harasses employees. Um, most of the times, that's what's going to cause your employees to go out and seek a third party uh, uh, for protection. So uh, th that's what we see. It's not the economic issues that bring right. the union to the table, it's the emotional issues of, of Is that what you see as well? Well, the, absolutely. And to add to that, what we're seeing a lot more of is that unions are a lot more savvy. It's not like, you know, the unions out there with their signed Local 123. What they'll do is they'll join with environmental groups and other nonprofits to highlight exactly what Jake said, emotional issues. Um, a good example is independent contractors in the trucking industry. Um, they historically and legally have been um, independent contractors, but now they're getting together with environmental groups and these wage groups. Even though the law is contrary, they're making emotional pleas to the general public. And they use these nonprofit groups. And a lot of times what you think may be an advocacy group or a nonprofit group, whether it's, you know, make the road by walking or, you know, some worker justice organization, they're actually union groups that are out there and oftentimes you'll see them in churches working with churches and minority populations and um, they, they go out and they target them behind the scenes so they're not necessarily a union but they really are a union funded group so you're seeing a lot of subversive advertisement and recruitment through these um, nonprofits and I guess we see this sometimes in some of the political activities that uh, typically had just been maybe the Democrats against the Republicans or but, but then also the SEIU shows up with their yellow shirts or whatever. I mean, they seem to be engaging a lot in areas that are, I guess, outside of the, uh, what we would call the typical bounds of union activities. I mean, are, I mean they, they're pretty aggressive now, aren't they? <laughs> they are, and a good example of that is the whole issue of immigration. Right. Uh, SEIU in particular will use that as a way to get a foothold in a company, and they'll argue with the employee, hey, uh, we have uh, immigration information available at the union. Would you like that? And that's a good way for them to engender goodwill with the workforce. But uh, we see Unite Here do that as well. They offer immigration seminars that bring the people in. And once they're in, they say, OK, well, you've heard our presentation on immigration. Now, uh, how does your boss treat you? Uh, what kind of wages do you earn? That's a common lure that unions are using today. All right, explain Unite Here so everyone knows. Many of our viewers probably know. But well, Unite Here is the main union uh, devoted to representing uh, employers in the hospitality industry. It uh, is an amalgamation of uh, two other uh, unions that, uh, that have now formed Unite Here, and they're the main union that deals with the hospitality industry. And how prevalent do you see them um, in the industry? I mean, are they gaining strength? I mean, how, how's this? Well, in, in certain uh, geographic regions they are. I mean, they tend to be concentrated in the large metropolitan areas. You can imagine LA is a strong uh, Unite Here city, uh, New York, of course, uh, Boston, Chicago, but they are expanding into other areas, including the Sun Belt. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it, it, it's a big country out there and they're trying to expand and flex their muscle. Uh, their preference is to try to get companies to agree to union representation without an election. Again, they would prefer to strong arm the employer into a neutrality agreement 
whereby the election never happens, the employees decide whether or not they have a union just by a showing of, of cards. And basically, if a majority of the employees sign union authorization cards, the union gets in automatically. Chip, the problem with that is sometimes car the cards are signed uh, under false pretenses. I've had situations where cards get signed, they tell employees that this is a raffle. We're gonna sign the cards and, <laughs> and stick all of the cards in and we're gonna have a raffle. Right. Uh, many times employees sign union authorization cards just so the, the, the organizer will leave them alone. Uh, the best way to decide whether an employee group will be represented by a union is to have a secret ballot election. That's been the law for the last 60 years and that's the preferred way to decide the issue. Unite here would prefer to do the union uh, card check uh, method though. And it, it would seem to me that secret ballot elections, the way we elect the President of the United States and all of our legislatures, and that would seem fair enough for, for union organizing, but how long does, and I've always wondered this question, how long from the time you sign the card is the card good? I mean, is it it's great, not good for eternity, is it? Great question. You know, the, the card is good for a year. And it's misleading because a lot of people don't understand, a lot of hourly employees don't understand that the card is a contract. If you sign that card, you're obligating yourself to allowing the third party union to represent them. So it, it, it's a small card, big trouble in many cases. And, and being from New Jersey, as you mentioned, <laughs> secret, secret ballot election, you're going to a location behind there, no one knows what you're doing. With the cards, how they obtain the cards, I think is another issue. Because if you have some guy knocking on your door saying, hey, you know, you're going to sign this card, and he's got three big guys behind him, they'll sign the card, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're an employer, and perhaps this union organizing has been going on without your knowledge, but now, all of a sudden, you, you're made aware of it. What can you do from that point to at least slow it down. Well, great. Um, the, the most important thing is you need to remember that this area is governed by the law. And the law is pretty simple in this area. It, it sort of makes a lot of common sense. Uh, number one, you can always state your opinion. In, uh, company managers and even company owners can state their opinions about the union. Hey. I don't want the union here. I've seen what unions have done to other industries. And you're always free to state your opinion. Uh, many, time, many times employers, uh, they get shy and, and they, they don't get proper legal advice and they somehow believe that you can't state your opinion. You can. The second thing is you have to remember that you can't threaten, interrogate, promise, or spy on union uh, supporters. So you can't threaten to close down the facility if they vote union. Uh, that seems pretty uh, obvious. You can't interrogate an employee about their union support or not. Uh, you can't promise to increase pay or benefits during the pendency of the campaign. And you can't spy on union employees or union supporters during the pendency of the campaign. But you can always state your opinion and you should state your opinion. What have you seen, Sal? I mean, what, what is the best tactic or tactics for an employer to, to use to, to try to stem the tide of, of what may be a momentum towards organizing? Very, very simple. Simply hire Jake. We'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think um, getting information out there, um, and because a lot of times when the unions come in, they'll make promises that um, they can't keep. They'll talk about, we'll get you extra benefits, more money, overtime. You know, I think in reality by getting information out there of how um, your pay, your benefits is actually in line with industry standards and actually exceeds industry standards in some instances I think is good. And just explaining your position and what would happen if a union was in there, what's happening with unionized, other similar situated employers that are unionized and simply getting information out to your employees. So just simply providing the information which would dispel some of the I guess, rosy predictions of what may happen if, in fact, you, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the labor side gets their, gets their way. I mean, they're, they're probably over-promising. And if you just simply provide the information, that's one of the best ways for an employee to say, yeah, I might not want to go down that road. Yeah. 
And um, you know, I think that's where an attorney who knows what they're doing comes into play too, because they'll know what you can say and what you can't say in order to keep out yourself out of trouble and get as much information. Um, and it really is a campaign, like any other campaign. You're telling your employees, this is how we do business, this is what we can do for you, this is why a union is bad. Right. Um, and the union behind the scenes is doing the opposite. I've seen where they've offered people jobs. If you get X amount of people to vote for us, you know, we'll make you part of the union, we'll make you an agent or something along <laughs> those lines and that type of stuff I think is actually pretty common so right. um, well we're gonna to have to cut it there but we've got another show on this issue so uh, I want to say thank you to my two guests today Jacob Monty with Monty and Ramirez thank you for being with us and of course Sal Sameo with Ford and Harrison gentlemen thank you my for pleasure. your time today thank you. we've got a lot more on this subject coming up next week so make sure to join us and if you'd like to contact me you can do it via email chip at ahoa.com that's chip at ahoa.com thanks for watching we'll see you again next week